group, welcome to this Washington Ideas uh, Roundtable series at the Aspen Institute. It's a pleasure to welcome you, President, our President of the, of the Aspen Institute, Walter Isaacson, is here with us. I'm sure he'll want to say a word. My job is just to say what we're trying to achieve today. We're bringing together uh, leaders from Silicon Valley as well as leaders from Washington on the issue of cyber, cyber future, cyber threats to government, to businesses, to individuals in this country and beyond. Uh, we're going to hear in a minute from Professor Joe and I, the founder of our Aspen Strategy Group, and several of our experts will be joined by Lisa Monaco, the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security. She actually has a very good excuse for why she's late, and we've put, she's meeting with the President. Uh, and so she asked if we could just schedule this for five as opposed to four, so she will join us and we will hear from her. And the point here is to try to trade uh, opinions and views as to the best course for business, government, nonprofits going forward. Uh, a word about the Aspen Strategy Group. Uh, we were founded more than three decades ago as a nonpartisan foreign policy group by Joe Nye, my friend and colleague from the Harvard Kennedy School, by General Brent Scowcroft, by Bill Perry, who a lot of you in California know, our former Secretary of Defense who lives out there now. And the idea is to have a forum annually where Americans, independent, Republican, and Democrat, get together on a nonpartisan basis to think through the, the most important challenges to our national security. Thirty years ago, in the middle of the Cold War, it was the nuclear standoff with the Soviet Union. And in 2015, cyber has to be at the heart of that discussion. So we're really pleased that you're here with us. And um, this conference is thanks to Michelle Smith and the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation. They've sponsored this roundtable. We want to thank them. Uh, the order of battle is Joe Nye will chair the meeting. He'll say a few words to frame the issue, introduce two of our friends from California who've just flown in on the red eye, arrived at 5 a.m. this morning. We'll be joined by Lisa, and then we'll have a discussion with all of you. So thank you for being here. Joe Nye. Thanks, Nick. Uh, we're going to uh, do something that's now very fashionable in education, which is flip, flip, flip the classroom originally we were uh, expecting Lisa to start out, and we were going to hear from Vinod and Jim uh, commenting on them. But uh, we're now going to start with the commentators and then get the main speech uh, because of the reasons that Nick uh, gave. Uh, so uh, there is a question that we want to look at in broad detail and then in a somewhat uh, more specific range as, as we do these starters. And that's uh, the nature of, uh, of cyber threats. When we look back at the construction of the internet, uh, if you talk to somebody like uh, uh, Vince Sturf or Dave Clark or others who were working on this uh, many years back, uh, security wasn't on their mind. It was a small village, uh, people who were trying to connect to each other. And uh, they created something quite remarkable, but uh, not very secure. And the conventional wisdom now is that uh, the Internet is an area where offense dominates defense, that uh, you have an enormous opportunity for anyone to, uh, to essentially use the various holes in the system. Um, perhaps most amusing was somebody from Boston who suffered through the last uh, six months of deflategate about whether a football was properly inflated or not is to realize that uh, uh, in baseball, they're now facing their own uh, uh, new scandal of uh, cybersecurity. Um, uh, but the point, I think, that, uh, that, is, uh, that we do want to get out on the table is what's the shape of the problem? And is it, are we stuck with it this way, or can it be changed? And there are two huge trends that are obviously going on. One is the movement to an Internet of Things, where you may have 50 billion connections to the Internet. Um, and the other is, of course, mobility. And we have two people who are ideally suited to address that. Uh, Vina Kosla, who is uh, 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 one of the early uh, uh, founders of uh, Sun Microsystems, and whose biography is in front of you. you can look for yourself. And I'm going to ask Noah to uh, say a little bit about the general shape of the problem of security and how it's evolving. And then uh, I'm going to turn to Jim Dolce, who's uh, uh, head of uh, CEO of Lookout, uh, based in San Francisco, but uh, originally a Bostonian. 
and uh, ask him to say a little bit about what does, uh, what does security look like in a world of mobility. So, Vinod, you know, maybe I can turn to you first. Thanks, uh, Joe. Um, let me give you a broad overview of many I'm sorry. Uh, let me start again. Uh, so I suspect many of you understand security better than I do, but uh, I sort of have a broad perspective being part of the Valley ecosystem for a long time and seeing transitions in technology happen. Also, we're investors in many, uh, a number of security companies, so it gives me a different kind of perspective. It feels to me like we are at an age where solutions are producing incremental returns. We are at the top of an S-curve in terms of payback versus effort, and that often happens where in technology where the returns from a certain amount of effort keep going down, it's sort of marginal return economics going down. The problem, on the other hand, is going the other way. The, because of the complexity of the systems, the nature of the problems is growing exponentially, and I think we are seeing symptoms of that. So we have two trends that fundamentally are going to make our current approach, which is a series of patches, one after another, mostly untenable at some point, and I don't know how, uh, how Herculean an effort we can put in till we find a fundamental solution. It feels like uh, security hasn't been the goal of the design of our architectures for computing in general and information technology. Uh, the directions where things are going makes the problem much worse because the amount of data is increasing, the number of vulnerability points is increasing, refrigerators uh, were used for the first time to spread botnets, uh, and we are at the very beginning of the Internet of Things, which, which would create a massive problem. On the other side, most of corporate America is going to a concept called data lakes. They're combining data in ways which makes it much more accessible and much more accessible to hacking. So it feels to me that we fundamentally have to reinvent the architecture. Of course, a forklift is not possible. We can't replace the internet overnight. But every part of the system creates a problem, whether it's storage or the way we do processors or the way we do networks, the way we do our software architectures. Um, and they're not designed for some of the fundamentals needed for security. Identity, encryption, encryption out rest, accountability, auditability, many of the things that are key to building a security architecture aren't part of the system. Um, so it feels like we'll have to start from scratch and find a clever way to get it adopted because we're not gonna change it overnight. Um, we've gone through this before. IT systems were the same way, in fact, I think early in the 90s, there was a seminal paper on uh, computer architectures that was titled, it had a very funny title, called The Bazaar Versus the Fossilized Dinosaur Turd. You can Google it. And, and the idea was, as you add to systems, they get more and more fragile over time. While bazaars are relatively resilient things and they grow and expand and contract relatively seamlessly. And that was the fundamental basis where Linux got to dominate as an operating system and the paper was about Linux, even though it had this funny title. Um, it's, it's worth reading because it's a style of operations we'll have to do more and more in technology because of the rate of change. Uh, so it was called the bazaar versus the what uh, no, versus the, the fossil. It's, it's the, the cathedral cath versus the, cathedral the, the yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I, okay. right. Um, 
having said that, we've, so we've gone through that kind of transition before, um, where you design for adaptability, evolvability of systems, not for optimization at a point in time, where you design for standards and other things. Fortunately, I see a lot of technologies coming along that will help us a lot in this. Um, it's odd to me that every device doesn't have a signature that is clearly identifiable. You know, signing is key to accountability and auditability. That doesn't exist, but there's technologies like uh, POV, what they call POVs, the unclonable functions where every device can be uniquely identified. I think the blockchain, yeah, we hear the Bitcoin version of it, but is probably the safest way to establish identity. And many of the contractual things that are part of identity, so you can do software contracts in it. So that's another really interesting tool we have in designing such a system. Um, I'm very excited by how much progress machine learning, you hear about deep learning and other things are making. And that problem, uh, the security problem will best be attacked by solutions like machine learning, especially some of the newer versions that have completely changed that field over the last two or three years. Um, so we have the tools we have the motivation. The process has to be really, really interesting. And uh, we were talking a little bit about it with uh, Tony Scott, who's the CIO over at the White House earlier today. This idea that there should be an open source process for both the design and architecture, not rely on experts or institutions, but crowdsource all the wisdom into coming up with the right architecture. It's an unorthodox way to design a complex system, but I actually believe the only possible way to design it well. Um, the right, and, and that just needs convening the right people, and that can be done relatively easily. Once we have the architecture, and Joe, I'll shut up very quickly. There's another major problem, which is how do you insert a new architecture into an existing architecture? Uh, interestingly, we have a number of opportunities. The best way to insert a new technology is to do it in a small niche, not overhaul the whole system overnight, and let it grow in its importance. So I'll let Jim talk about mobile because it's a key new technology that's creating a key new problem. And so there's a lot of motivation to solve it. But let me talk about another opportunity I see. The Internet of Things essentially does not exist today. It's relatively toyish and trivial. And maybe the largest presence of, uh, of compute devices and sensors in 10 years or 15 years. So it's an opportunity to rethink security in that context, establish it in a niche like that or a niche like mobile, and, and design a new architecture using a very open, transparent, standards-based process, um, and introduce it that way. I actually think there's both an opportunity and existence proof that this can happen. Uh, I'll give you two examples because most people, when I talk to them about this, feel it's not possible to change the architecture of the Internet. Let me tell you a funny story. In 1996, we were starting a computer company called, uh, a networking company called Juniper. Every single major customer we talked to said they would never, never adapt TCP IP for the public Internet. This was not very long ago, 1996. Um, there was a technology, alternative technology called ATM, which AT&T, Verizon, almost every vendor had standardized on. The Cisco CTO, which was the center of TCP IP, told me they would never do a router at a data rate called OC12. That's about the service I get in my house today, never. 
What we did was introduce routers at Juniper in a niche in a small network called the UUNet network and grew with it. And because it was growing exponentially, it got to dominate. I'm almost certain if Juniper hadn't started, we wouldn't have a TCP IP internet because we were listening to large institutional customers who had a preordained view of what the network of the future looked like. It's interesting to go back and read the press in 1996. There is zero mention of TCP IP as a public network, even though it was dominant. I think that model will apply to security or can be made to apply to security with the right convening of the open source architecture, a few critical pushes, a few clever startups. It can't be done top down in a big way. It has to sneak into the door and grow exponentially and be almost viral in its impact. Uh, let me stop there, Joe, and... Well, that's, that's great. There are lots of questions that you've raised, like the whole role of blockchain of opening things up. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> so um, there's a lot of talk about um, all of these devices connecting to the internet, especially with the new concept of the internet of things and, and the promise of perhaps 50 million devices uh, being interconnected, 50 billion devices being interconnected, sorry. Um, but the fact is today that we each carry a mobile phone, which is also connected to the internet. And believe it or not, there, we are approaching 5 billion of those devices on the planet. There's just over 7 billion people on the planet yet. Uh, we are approaching 5 billion mobile devices, very sophisticated computers attached to the internet at all times. Um, even in this room, each of our phones is currently attached uh, to the internet. And so what, what do governments do um, and how, what do they need to think about as, as you know, we look at 5 billion connected devices connected via uh, the mobile network? Um, uh, this is becoming a big problem not only for governments but also for enterprise customers because um, there's uh, this concept of bring your own device or BYOD uh, that's sort of emerging in, in corporate America. And it's come on uh, CIOs and CISOs very quickly. Um, only five years ago, ten years ago, we carried Blackberries. They were secure. They were closed. Uh, they were owned by the company, uh, and you controlled everything that went on and off of that device. <clears throat> um, uh, we, with BYOD, we bring our personal device uh, to the office, and we use it in the work environment. It's a concept we call co consumerization of IT. The IT d <coughs> environment now uh, in, in the enterprise and government uh, is becoming consumerized. And as, as a result, it... it it represents a brand new threat vector uh, to governments and enterprises uh, alike. You know, in, and uh, with so many devices and with BYOD coming on so quickly, you know, we've got to begin to change the way that we approach security. Security to date has been very reactive. Um, if you look at, at the OPM breach, um, I rest assured there will be a lot of cybersecurity companies that will get orders as a result of the OPM uh, breach uh, in the very near future. That's a reactive model. Um, the question is, how do we get in front of the problem as it grows, as, 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 as it grows in scale? Five billion mobile devices become 50 billion IoT devices, et cetera. Uh, and we have to then move from this reactive model to a proactive model or even better, a predictive model. And the question then becomes, how do we predict uh, that a threat is going to happen before it happens and in turn uh, mitigate it uh, before it causes any, any damage? There are tech, we have to take a very different technology approach to that. Our technology approach to security used to be we put a perimeter around our, uh, our data center, um, our enterprise we, in the form of firewalls. Um, and uh, with all the data being inside the perimeter, uh, we have this nice wall around us. Uh, bad guys can't get in. 
you know, unless they are able to breach the firewall. Um, the problem today is the perimeter is exposed. It's not a wall anymore. There was a conversation this morning. It was described as a chain link fence. It's every time we bring a mobile device into the, the inside the perimeter, uh, we're basically poking a hole in the perimeter. Uh, and and with each of us carrying those mobile devices inside of the perimeter, the the what used to be a wall, you know, a solid wall, is now. A, a, a chain link fe fence as appropriately described. Um, the only solution to get in front of a problem of such massive scale uh, that's coming on us so quickly is to use very different technologies, these predictive technologies which are based on on the concepts or the technologies uh, like big data and machine learning. You know, uh, um, uh, referred to ML or machine learning uh, in his opening remarks uh, this is what we use to predict threats, uh, to get in front of threats and mitigate, mitigate them before uh, they, they are actually able to happen. Today at Lookout, um, we've been predominantly a consumer-oriented business, a consumer-oriented technology since inception six, six, seven years ago. We've got 70 million consumers around the world, 200 plus countries and territories, all using our technology and each one of them, each one of those 70 million devices with our technology on it becomes a sensor to, to, to in, in effect, a large sensor network, global sensor network that's collecting threat data, contributing it to a central data set uh, where we perform correlations and machine learning algorithms so that we can predict what might happen uh, and learn to mi mitigate uh, uh, those threats before they happen and move this from a very reactive situation um, uh, to a, a more proactive and more, pr more predictive situation, uh, again, using new technologies that, uh, that sort of change the entire paradigm, change the model uh, uh, relative to the model that we've been using traditionally. That's a, that's a terrific introduction. We're about to have uh, Lisa, if, I, if the signal loss I have received from the back mm -hmm. of the room, or she's about to arrive, but Perhaps it's uh, very dramatic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, uh, if I could uh, start with a, a question just to to uh, keep the conversation going while we await her arrival, we may keep the answer uh, short. Uh, you know, if we go back to your to your points, uh, blockchain has been very heavily associated with Bitcoin, and Bitcoin has a lot of extra baggage. But the essential idea of blockchain does provide an open form of identification. Is that the way it will, I mean, machine learning and predictive approaches are, are going to be crucial. But is blockchain going to be the basis in which we move toward re-architecting? Um, it's one possible. The blockchain is one possible solution. It's often misunderstood because what that system is about is a massively secure way to do distributed trust. So trust is the fundamental basis of many things in society, and the blockchain is a way to do trust. One application of trust is doing a currency that has certain characteristics, and because those characteristics are embodied in a software contract, among parties to that currency. And this is not understood. You can embed software contracts that are self-enforcing into the blockchain. And there's details like sidechains. The currency then is a currency where inflation cannot be managed centrally. It has certain characteristics. New notes can't be issued. All that is embedded in a, contra in a self-enforcing contract. That's why it's used for uh, Bitcoin as a currency. But think of Bitcoin as a currency as only one application. If you want to do land titles, there's no better way to do land titles or escrow services than in the blockchain. And I, I wish Bitcoin hadn't happened first because the other applications of the blockchain are far more pervasive. The most interesting is, of course, identity. And if you have identity, you have a basis for trust and auditability and accountability, fundamental characteristics of a secure system. 
So I think that's what's promising about it. it, it to Jim, on, if you look at the question of uh, your model uh, for how you're going to provide security to your mobile customers, what's going to be the, or, without giving away <laughs> the trade secret, but what, what's the key technology that you see uh, uh, for the mobile security? So as I mentioned, um, machine learning and predictive analytics you know, is the central technology. You know, it is a, a matter of, of uh, using machines to uh, analyze data, to correlate data, and from that analysis to, to determine that there can and will be a threat, um, and to take the human factor as much as possible out of that process. Um, again, simply because you cannot scale uh, humans in, in the same way that you can scale machines. I mean, we you know, uh, use cloud services uh, uh, for our analysis engine, and we can turn up several thousand computers, virtual machine instances, uh, in, in literally minutes uh, to process the data set as it gets larger and larger and larger. Um, you can't go find several thousand people in a short period of time uh, to do this in any kind of manual way. So it is a matter of, of collecting massive amounts of data, big data, uh, and using uh, algorithms, machine learning algorithms, uh, to analyze the data and predict threats from the data set. So blockchain and machine learning and predictive analysis based on big data, is that what we mean by re-architecting the Internet? You know, those are component technologies. This is why I suggested an open architecture document that the whole public could contribute to. And there's many such projects that have been done that way and done really, really well. Uh, but the components are all there that are essential elements. PUFFs are provably unclonable functions is what PUFF stands for. Yeah. Uh, Vinod was just finishing yeah. this question of re-architecting the internet, but then we're going to But for security, every person has to have identity, every device has to have identity, and that's why the puff function is so important, and everything should have an identity. A bottle of wine is the bottle of wine bottled by the manufacturer, or baby, baby food that's not adulterated with other stuff. Once you have that and you have machine learning technologies to do behavioral analysis, I suspect you can identify people with just how they type on their keyboard, which tower they're talking to, which cell phone tower they're talking to, um, what their environment is like. Their phone is giving you barometer and pressure and temperature, like can you identify the location they are at because you happen to have data. All those combined into complex models and data that you can't imagine would be relevant to security, will be relevant to behavioral analysis using some of the newer machine learning technologies. And that essentially makes all the components. How we put together is this open source process I was talking about the architecture. I wouldn't presume to sit here and be able to design an architecture for security, but I do think we can both design one and find ways to insert it where it's relatively painless to insert it into the current architecture we have. Great, thank you. We're lucky to have Monaco here. Uh, it's uh, one of these situations where, uh, as the saying goes, she needs no introduction. But I was at a meeting not too long ago with Henry Kissinger, and the chairman said something like, Henry needs no introduction. And Henry's comment is, oh, go ahead anyway. <laughs> so I will just say the following, that if young uh, Harvard graduates come to me and they say, what do you think I should do? I have no idea what to do for a job and next year. And uh, I will now tell them, well, go and look at Lisa Monaco's biography. Because when she graduated from Harvard, she went to Washington as, I think, a copy editor on the Woodrow Wilson Quarterly. That's and from that, in 25 years, she ran, rose to be assistant to the president for a 
homeland security and counterterrorism, uh, making life and death decisions. That's quite an extraordinary uh, career. Uh, now, it was punctuated by things like a Chicago law degree and uh, work in the Justice Department, clerking, and all the rest of that, but that's in the bio you can read. I think the important thing is to say that uh, uh, we are delighted to have you here uh, and looking forward to your remarks and to warn you that this is on the record. And I'll push your microphone up. Thank you very much, Joe. And first, um, uh, let me apologize for um, being late and uh, appreciate the flexibility in uh, switching the agenda a little bit. Um, I don't get to use this uh, excuse often, but uh, when I do, it is, in fact, the best one you can have, which is the president made me late. So, um, uh, but That's I, better than the dog ate my homework. Yes, it, it's a version of, but uh, this one uh, is, is really true. Uh, so I appreciate uh, your uh, indulgence here. Uh, I'll just say a few things um, at the start uh, because I do want to get to questions. I know that's uh, what you come here for, uh, to have a robust discussion. First, uh, let me thank uh, Joe and the uh, Aspen Strategy Group for convening this, for inviting me, uh, particularly timely, which was not the plan uh, <laughs> when the uh, letter went out. But uh, it is good to be here. Uh, it is obviously a very timely focus, uh, this group, uh, the Aspen Strategy Group in particular, but I know seeing a lot of familiar faces around the table uh, what an important uh, issue this is, cybersecurity writ large, cyber threats of particular concern, uh, obviously, to me. Um, and I see some uh, real thought leaders around the table on this, so I'll be interested to get your questions. Um, the, let me say a word about how we're viewing the threat uh, and some of the issues we confront uh, to kind of frame uh, our discussion. Uh, obviously, the OPM breaches is just uh, the most recent example uh, of the threat that we're facing. Uh, what we have seen um, is a threat that is, I think, fair to say, expanding in every single dimension uh, that you can look at, from uh, the frequency of attacks, uh, the scale of those attacks, uh, the sophistication and the severity of the impact that we're seeing. Um, and that um, range of uh, evolution in the threat that we're seeing is frankly a focus uh, for me every morning in the President's daily brief. Um, Joe made mention of my current role, uh, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, which, as many of you know, uh, includes a portfolio of everything from terrorist threats, terrorist actors here as well as abroad, to pandemics, to cyber threats, to uh, uh, crazy weather events and storms and severe weather and the like. So it's quite broad. But increasingly, that morning session with the president, the president's daily brief, uh, on my list of things that I'm talking to the president about every day includes cyber threats. Now, that may not seem a remarkable statement. Um, to people, but uh, it is a clear evolution, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, to be sure, terrorist threats, foreign policy issues are always uh, the currency of the day in that meeting, um, but as long as I've been in the job, and certainly over the last year, uh, 2014 has been dubbed by some of you, I think, around the table as the year of the breach, um, but increasingly, the things that uh, are included on our list of dangerous, complex threats are cyber threats. Whether it's to retailers, um, Target, Home Depot, you name it, to, of course, government systems uh, and the like. So it has risen up uh, the list of complex threats that are daily uh, fodder for our discussions. Um, and, of course, that's because, as I mentioned, nobody's immune from retailers to government systems uh, to uh, other forms of uh, private entities. Um, and the, what we've also seen in the evolution uh, is the range of actors that we're confronting. So that includes, uh, obviously, uh, the range of state actors familiar uh, to many of you, and we can talk about that, 
to non-state actors increasingly to kind of proxy criminal syndicates uh, and the like. Uh, and I think one of the things we are seeing is a few features that combine to make both the threat ratchet up, the severity and the scale, and the frequency increase uh, across this range of actors. And I, and I would posit it to a few things. One, very low barriers to entry. Uh, two, uh, the means and the mechanisms are, and here I, by, here, by this I mean malware, quite frankly, is widely available, easy to obtain, low cost, and there are techniques that have become, like the spearfish, that has become basically the bread and butter of um, uh, the cyber threat and the cybersecurity vulnerability that we face. Uh, a comment about uh, the threat actors. Uh, broadly speaking, state and non-state actors. The state actors, uh, again, uh, familiar to many of you, uh, but there are ways that we think about them that differentiate uh, from the more sophisticated end, China and Russia, uh, in terms of their uh, techniques and their areas of focus, uh, to those that have demonstrated uh, more disruptive and in times destructive uh, intent, those being, of course, Iran and North Korea. On the non-state actor front, uh, almost more insidious in some respects. Uh, you, the hacker for hire phenomenon, which is likely familiar to many of you. Uh, these folks are profit driven uh, and uh, may not always be operating for their own uh, profit motive, but being, uh, as the name implies, hired by some of uh, the uh, entities that I just listed in the other bucket. Um, criminal syndicates, uh, the uh, a term that I think is quite anachronistic, patriotic hackers, these uh, entities, non-state actors with an ideological bent, uh, and of course, terrorist groups uh, that we are increasingly concerned about uh, for two reasons, certainly for their propaganda purposes, and here obviously ISIL is a, a very good example of that, um, but also for using um, the cyber threat vector to perpetrate uh, terrorist acts or destructive acts. Um, so what are we doing about it? Uh, a number of things, and I think you can look back at the last six months and see um, a steady drumbeat of action and leadership, but that's just over the last six months. Uh, you can trace back to uh, the very beginning of President Obama's administration uh, where he uh, moved out quickly uh, to look at this threat and assign it as both, and I think this is very important, one of the greatest national security and economic security challenges that we face. And that, I think, is something that should be underscored uh, and not lost. Uh, but when you look at uh, the things we're doing, I think you can uh, focus it in two broad categories. Obviously, raising our cyber defenses, uh, which is uh, increasingly a challenge, but something that cannot be um, uh, underscored enough. Uh, here, uh, the initiation of the industry-led, and this is, a, I think, a theme, too, in uh, our approach, which I think uh, is uh, something that uh, is uh, extremely important to continue to press on, and that's one of partnership with industry. The cybersecurity framework that was um, uh, announced last year after a industry-led and cooperative process with the Commerce Department and NIST, uh, setting forth a baseline set of common, um, and uh, my team hates this phrase, but cyber hygiene uh, to employ, to raise best practices both in, in the government but as well in the, in, uh, in the private sector. Uh, issuing an uh, executive order uh, to impose cyber sanctions or creating a framework to have that tool in our toolkit, uh, just like we do uh, in the terrorism realm. Uh, the increasing emphasis on creation of, cyber, of uh, information sharing uh, networks and organizations, so creating a forum where private sector can share amongst itself as well as with the government. Uh, the legislative proposal uh, that was put forth um, earlier this year uh, to uh, encourage and incentivize 
importantly, information sharing between the private sector and the government. Uh, and then uh, something uh, in the category, uh, a set of things in the category of increasing our cyber response capabilities. And here is uh, something I, I think I would, I would end with, which is uh, the experience we've had as a government and as a culture, quite frankly, over the last decade plus since 9-11, I think has shown uh, that we've done a number of things quite well to organize ourselves and change ourselves structurally and culturally when it comes to combating the terrorism threat. Uh, not perfect, but we've put a number of things in place so that there is a muscle memory, if you will, amongst the government and the, the uh, professionals who are charged with defending us and responding to terrorism threats. Uh, and these are features known uh, to many of you. I would argue that we need to do a similar thing and set up a similar level and exercise it of muscle memory when it comes to the cyber threat. Uh, um, uh, among these things that we're trying to build in uh, to that muscle memory are two examples I'll give you. One is setting up uh, within uh, the National Security Council something called the Cyber Response Group, which mirrors uh, the um, counterterrorism security group that has been in existence uh, at the senior uh, government level uh, for uh, multiple decades now, uh, which is a set of repeat players at the assistant secretary level who come together to address both operationally and coordination-wise, but also policy-wise, the greatest uh, threats that we face both on the terrorism side, but now we're setting up a similar, and we have set up uh, a similar um, uh, apparatus for, uh, to uh, enable us to respond to cyber threats and create the same situational awareness across the government uh, amongst repeat players to respond to cyber threats. And then lastly, uh, the announcement we made in February, which is uh, the Cyber Threat uh, Intelligence Integration Center, this so-called CTIC, uh, which is the one place in the government where intelligence and analysis will come together and get integrated about the cyber threat. As a policymaker, I have available to me every morning the, um, the integrated, latest, best community judgment about terrorism threats. I get that without fail every morning, and I can call upon that, and I can um, uh, create that uh, demand for, that feeds into policy judgments. We need the same thing on the cyber threat. Uh, we're still too stovepiped when it comes to cyber threat and cyber intelligence and bringing uh, that together and having a holistic understanding at the senior policy level uh, to inform our judgments. And that's what uh, the CTIC uh, is all about. So those are just two examples of the type of muscle memory, as I've come to call it, that I think we need to put in place to enable us to respond better. This is, as I've said before, a generational challenge when it comes uh, to enabling us to address the cyber threat that we face. Um, it is uh, one that is going to continue to grow, and uh, we've got to uh, up our game to be able to combat it. So with that, let me stop talking and get to your questions. Thank you very much. Walter is our president. Sure, I want to drill down, if I may, Lisa, right on what you ended with, which is both the muscle memory and I guess another word for muscle memory is almost the doctrine that we would have for responses. And very specifically, when something like a breach at OPM happens, do we have a doctrine already in place that tells us how we're going to do it? And when you go in and brief about the OPM, let's leave the word China out of this because that, you know, just more generally, do you say, here are the five options for retaliating and what type of options could we use to retaliate against somebody, a state actor, let's start with, who did such a breach? So I think we, we've got a good example in, and. Uh, I'll set aside OPM uh, specifically for a minute. As you know, it's ongoing uh, in terms of the assessment there and the investigation there. But um, the Sony breach, which we dealt with um, just a number of uh, months ago, uh, the, what happens in that instance is a coming together 
of the intelligence community. Now we are doing it in a much more um, ad hoc is not a fair statement, but uh, it, it, it requires more, uh, more pull uh, than push. Uh, and uh, for instance, after the Sony attack happened, uh, we uh, respond by uh, gathering as much information as possible, giving our best, getting our best assessment of uh, what uh, was the cause of that. Can we uh, uh, make public that information? As you all know, we're talking about very sensitive at times sources and methods. There has to be a policy judgment made as to whether or not we're going to uh, uh, disclose uh, the actor involved and our assessment of the actor involved and what does that mean for disclosing uh, those intelligence sources and methods and then set about exactly as you say what are the options response uh, uh, response options uh, reaction options that are available to the president uh, are the doctrine here and the president has spoken to this uh, in the context also of the Sony attack uh, it is going to be uh, proportional it is going to be um, uh, consistent with international law, uh, but it is going to be responsive to uh, the attack itself. And in that case, it triggered a both a disclosure of and a calling out, if you will, of the actor involved, because it uh, tripped a wire, if you will. It was unique in its destructiveness, its coercion, and its coercive uh, effect uh, and purpose behind it, and yes, uh, a state actor who had clearly uh, evidenced uh, a desire to have a coercive effect at bottom as well as a destructive effect. All of those things combined uh, to inform the policy judgment of two things. One, are you going to disclose uh, who you think did it and why, uh, and uh, two, uh, what, what the options are on the table. And some, as uh, I think others who follow this closely know, uh, will not necessarily always be public. Some uh, responses will be public, some may not be. And you want to, as a policymaker, uh, make sure that you have both of those options uh, in your, uh, at your disposal uh, and not to take either one of them off the table. But there were responses that were not public then in the Sony case? Well, good, good try. They are, but yeah. Good try, Walter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and at the uh, time, uh, the executives at Sony, as you know, have a mm -hmm. strong feeling on this. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, as those of you who followed it closely at the time, um, the uh, there was a, I think, careful um, discussion of this that we're not always going to discuss every response that happens. I'm not going to say whether there were or there weren't because that would obviously um, uh, not be consistent. Uh, with making sure that we keep all those options on the table. Uh, but as a principle, uh, in order to keep uh, a range of options uh, at your disposal, uh, we're not always going to talk about what we're doing. David? Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for doing this. Let me follow on Walter's question on Dr. I think you touched on a really interesting question here with the comparison between Push your Korea. Button. Sorry, you've touched on an interesting issue with the comparison between North Korea and, say, the two other breaches that you've handled since the uh, attack on the State Department and, and the White House, which I don't think you've attributed to, but it's been widely reported to have been Russian in origin, and the attack on OPM that you mentioned, which who knows, but every congressman and senator who comes out of a closed session says was Chinese and usually says it on the record. Um, so. You're in this odd position now where you've declared in one case, in, in the North Korea case, um, Sony, and you ran into a lot of people who actually doubted, doubted that. And then you go into cases where there was not destruction of data, but theft of data, and that would be the White House, State Department, and, and OPM, where you haven't declared who it is. What are we supposed to think here about how you and the president are considering the options here. What makes the theft of data, other than the fact that that's a more usual espionage kind of case, different from the decision that you made 
in, uh, in, North Korea, in the North Korea case? Are we to assume that destructive hacks are ones where you do call it out and you do respond and theft is more criminal? How are we supposed to think about it? And um, secondly, on OPM, uh, there was a hearing today in which the OPM folks had to go explain what had happened. And it was a pretty savage hearing in which um, you had a lot of members of Congress who were asking why the most basic hygiene, to use the phrase you just used, wasn't used at OPM. That there was access to the system without two-party uh, authentication, or uh, there was no um, encryption as they discussed themselves. They described an incredibly old system that couldn't handle most of this. So I'm trying to square that with the President's initiatives that go back, as you said, to 2009. Mm -hmm. So let me take each one of these in turn. On your last point, um, I think, and I think it was um, said at the hearing today, um, as not unlike uh, um, corporations and private sector entities around the country, um, we are facing the same challenges that um, uh, the operators and owners of networks uh, around the country are facing. Uh, and uh, as I think Secretary Johnson has said, we're not where we need to be in terms of federal cybersecurity. Uh, and in many cases, as you indicated, we are dealing with legacy systems that are um, uh, the result of decades of, of um, uh, lack of investment in some, in some instances, and very complex systems where we're trying to, as I heard Vinod as I was coming in, talk about re-architecting security, which I think is, uh, is uh, a very challenging concept and one that I think uh, the head of every agency, the head of every corporation is, is probably dealing with. So there's no doubt uh, that we face uh, challenges uh, in terms of keeping up with the cybersecurity threat, and we've taken a number of steps to try and address that, deploying the Einstein system um, and um, doing things like continuous monitoring and diagnostics. All of these things are efforts uh, to keep up with uh, a threat when we're dealing with legacy systems. Um, with respect to how should we be thinking about the different types of attacks, first, let me say uh, quite clearly, since we are uh, on the record, I want to make sure this is very clear. Uh, I'm uh, not going to comment on uh, any attribution with respect to either the OPM uh, breach uh, or uh, the White House and State Department breach, as you've, as you've rightly noted. Uh, that has not been something we've, we've commented on, except to say that government networks, including the State Department, the White House, uh, uh, and others, are daily experiencing efforts to uh, intrude and to breach those systems. Uh, that is uh, a daily event, and anybody uh, who has responsibility for cybersecurity in the government will tell you that uh, from uh, both state actors as well as uh, from the range of other actors uh, that uh, I mentioned at the outset. Uh, but I am not uh, commenting here as to uh, the attribution of uh, either the OPM uh, breach or uh, the other ones that you mentioned. But in terms of your question about how should we be thinking about destructive attacks versus uh, theft, per se, and I would add another category to that, which is um, uh, DDoS attacks or denial of service attacks, which um, uh, are neither, fit in neither category, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, one answer, which may not be satisfactory, but I think is absolutely true, is we can't, um, we can't make a prescription uh, categorically, uh, but we're going to take each case as we find it. Where we saw the Sony hack be so destructive, be so coercive, uh, and the President was very clear on that, that is a, um, of a different uh, character uh, and uh, tripped a, um, a wire there uh, that indicated uh, that it was something that we needed to respond to. Indeed, because it was also, it was an attack on Sony's network and was destructive and was coercive, but uh, was one that was also an attack on free speech, quite frankly. So there uh, uh, we made quite clear uh, and were able to uh, attribute uh, through very good work 
uh, by the FBI and others and through the very good cooperation uh, of uh, Sony Pictures, uh, which is not something that should be um, uh, taken lightly. The fact that uh, the private entity in that instance and the corporation uh, immediately contacted the FBI uh, and was so uh, cooperative uh, in uh, working with uh, the FBI in its investigation enabled uh, that kind of work. So uh, I do want to put a plug in uh, for that kind of cooperation, which has got to be uh, something uh, that is a, the wave of the future. Uh, uh, sorry, David, we're, we've got a problem, which is a lot of people and little time. Tim. Thanks, Joe. I have a question that's relevant for the other panelists, too, though maybe first addressed to Ms. Monaco, uh, which is I'd be curious to know how you think about communicating technical information to non-technical policymakers and how decisions are made. So it's great you're thinking about centralization, having a common operating picture, trying to replicate the process that exists for counterterrorism and uh, reporting on terrorism threats. I'm curious to know if your vision is you get something like this uh, mm -hmm. to talk about the common operating picture for cyber threats to the United States. Uh, presumably that would not be the case, um, but it's hard to imagine exactly how you're getting from one place to another where you might have technical advisors, but how are you creating something different from the existing intelligence process? And I said this is relevant to the other policy mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, the other panelists because they all have some kind of experience with policymakers in organizations, not just the federal government and how you deal with communicating information to the president, but uh, you need to be able to inform a CEO of what's going on with information technology in their company. Uh, Joe, you've probably learned about this over the course of decades, over the course of uh, how nuclear weapons have evolved and decisions were made and how you communicate technical information to non-technical personnel. And then Vinod, uh, I'd be really curious to know if you have any insight into anything out there that's really different from how we conceptually think about now uh, interpreting computer network information and visualizing it. Um, it seems like most of the commercial products are really for a highly trained technical person. So what does the PDB look like, I guess, coming from CTIC uh, in that kind of world? Uh, well, I think it's a great, great question um, because you're quite right. There is, there's a level of technical information that we're going to be very concerned about. Um, both to uh, ensure that we are keeping up our own defenses and pushing those indicators uh, out both to the rest of the government as well as to the private sector. That's on one level. But um, what I think the CTIC, amongst other things, will be able to help us do is focus uh, the, both the cyber intelligence analysts as well as the regional analysts. So making sure that um, we're including the, uh, the best that the community has to offer when you're talking about a particular threat actor, whether it's a non-state actor or a state actor, both um, from their cyber capabilities, what is their intent, what is their capability to, uh, uh, to carry out that intent, and how does that factor into perhaps their regional motivations, et cetera. So I envision it being much less technical and more strategic, and also enabling policymakers to um, tier and understand how we should be thinking about those various threat actors and deploying our resources as against them. Uh, we're now low on time, long on questions. What I'm going to do is ask several people to quickly make a question quick. Mm -hmm. And then Lisa will have uh, her choice. I will choice. keep my you, answer you can, short. That's right. Ellen, you're next, then David, then Michael, then Adam, and that's <laughs> it so quickly. Ellen? Thank you. I'd like to uh, get back to the question of sponsors for a minute and uh, bring up a different use case, which was the, uh, the PLA-5 and their commercial espionage into mm -hmm. um, various uh, steel and other industries in the Western District of Pennsylvania. In that case, the United States responded with indictments, uh, a clear message that we will not tolerate commercial espionage. In other cases, such as perhaps the, uh, in part, the intrusions into the State Department and the White House, and more recently, OPM, we're talking about more traditional types of espionage that is not commercial espionage, 
How does that complicate your thinking in terms of what options you might have at your disposal to respond? Would you still, in that case, consider sanctions, indictments? You know, what message would that say? Uh, why don't we collect mm -hmm. them? Yep. Um, uh, David. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, Lisa, you mentioned the importance of cooperation uh, with the government and cited Sony's willingness to cooperate, share information with you. Obviously, uh, for t U.S. tech companies in the aftermath of the Snowden revelations, cooperating with the, with the U.S. government is highly problematic at a time when they're trying to convince their customers at home and abroad that they're not cooperating, that they're very distinct separations. So could you speak to that and a subset of that? At a time when the OPM leak shows, as the Snowden leak itself showed, that the government isn't very good at protecting secret information, don't you have an even worse problem in getting people to tell you things about this, cooperate, if those secrets could be leaked? Michael, or hacked. First, thank you for being here. Um, building on this question, where do you foresee the delicate balance between the relationship between the government and the private industry? Where, where is that sweet spot where you like that to be, where you feel it's comfortable, and what are the building blocks you foresee and the challenges to getting to that spot? Thank you. Okay. Adam, last question. Yeah. Um, Lisa, just your, your thought of where we are on rules of the road, government to government, government to industry, government to individuals, industry uh, to corporations. How are we doing? Where are we going? Thanks. Um, go there first. Uh, the, um, the most progress I think we could make on that is getting Congress to act on our legislative proposal that we put forward um, back in February, uh, which would set up a clear um, permission structure, if you will, for government to provide um, uh, cyber threat information, not content, but very tailored technical indicators of breaches um, to, uh, to the government and enable uh, the, and encourage, quite frankly, the sharing. So that's government to the private sector and vice versa, hopefully aided by the CTIC. Uh, but also encouraging the creation of information sharing organizations, which was part of the cybersecurity summit that the president uh, announced uh, at Stanford, and I ensuring uh, greater cooperation and sharing as amongst private sector to private sector. Uh, and as you know from your former role in the antitrust division many moons ago, we also issued guidance this year making quite clear that there was not an antitrust prohibition on that type of private to private sharing. So uh, getting Congress to act at long last on the information sharing legislation would, would uh, aid us greatly. On the cooperation piece, which I think is um, uh, both David's and Michael's question, uh, there, there's no doubt um, that the Snowden um, uh, disclosures, unauthorized disclosures, uh, has exposed a real concern amongst the private sector in terms of some of its cooperation with the government. I think there's two different things, though. There are incentives, uh, as we've seen in the past, for uh, corporations to assist the government when it comes to a specific investigation, particularly of their uh, of their um, networks or of their corporation, in part because they want us to act on it. Um, in the case of the indictments that uh, Ellen uh, uh, mentioned, there is a desire on the part of many corporations to say, you know, when are you going to come to help us uh, while our uh, R&D and our intellectual property uh, is uh, stolen? So that, that does um, uh, counterbalance to some degree uh, some of the concerns uh, that were raised in the, in the Snowden uh, unauthorized disclosures. Um, and then to Ellen's question, look, the, the reality is there's a range of tools that we can use. We've been about making sure that we increase the number and types of tools that we can use. So the PLA indictments, which uh, is an investigation that actually I started when I was the head of the National Security Division at the Justice Department, uh, is one set of tools, wanting to make sure that there is a way, uh, as we do in the terrorism world, even if we can't 
get our hands on that terrorist actor, there is going to be uh, an indictment at the ready um, uh, to, to make clear that that uh, should not go, that conduct should not go unaddressed. Sanctions are another tool, uh, and uh, diplomacy uh, that may not always see uh, the light of day, and intelligence uh, operations uh, that may not always see the light of day. These are a range and a suite of tools uh, that we want to make sure that we have uh, in our toolbox for every eventuality. And um, we've, you've seen how we've responded to uh, the Sony attack. There's going to be, uh, we want to make sure that there's a range of things that, that we have at our disposal as we face more and more of these in different types of permutations. Before we adjourn, I want to make sure that uh, Jim and Vinod have a chance for a final comment. So, Jim. Oh, sure. <coughs> One of the interesting things that was said here, especially um, with respect to all of these legacy systems that we have uh, and the difficulty uh, in uh, securing these legacy systems, particularly because many of them uh, are so old. Um, uh, before you um, joined us, uh, Lisa, we were talking about this new, relatively new threat vector, i.e. the mobile threat vector, mm -hmm. um, and as many as five billion uh, people now carrying mobile devices, smart devices. This is a brand new threat vector, and one I, th I believe we can get ahead of. Um, uh, and, and I often find in my discussions with um, various government entities that the, the mobile threat vector is something that is understood, um, and, and many times uh, we get an, an acknowledgement that the, an agency uh, would uh, like to trial our technology. Uh, but then they put it on the priority list, and they have many, many priorities, mm -hmm. many things that they need to trial. Um, and it often falls to the bottom of the priority list. Um, I would submit that this is a brand new threat vector. It is well understood. Um, there are technologies that are there today uh, that uh, uh, can mitigate the threats, um, and that um, perhaps it should get it should rise on the list of priorities because it is something that we can take care of today. And it is not an old legacy technology uh, or one of many, many legacy technologies that we're trying to uh, uh, basically plug holes with. You know, it's, it's sort of the, uh, the old adage of uh, sticking your finger in the dike to plug the holes. There's lots of holes, I'm sure. There's lots of leaks in the dike. Uh, this is one that we can get in front of. You know, we have, you'll have the last one. Okay. Um, as I as I said when I started, the problems are going getting exponentially worse. The solutions are getting incrementally better with a lot of effort, time, and money. It's very, very frustrating inside corporate America when you look at how much resource goes into and how little effect they have. Uh, I just end with a plea. Uh, I was. I realize we're in D.C., and all the questions were tactical. Lisa, how are you responding to this or that? Not the question about how where Joe actually started. How do we fundamentally change the balance be between defense and attack? I think that's where Joe started. That's a 10-year program of changing the architecture, the security architecture for our nation and the planet, and for all the cyber technologies we're dealing with. Now, I hope some of you focus on that and ask the questions that force people in Washington to think about fundamentally changing the balance of equation uh, instead of these tactical, like in Sony, you responded this way, or in OPM, what's the response? Uh, that'd be my plea to all of you. Well, 